Hey, just really quick before we get into today's episode, I wanted to let you know that I'm running a limited edition plush with Makeship, and this time it's Casper. So if you want to grab your own Casper plush, make sure you get him before he's gone. There's only like 19 days left. It is a limited run and he's not coming back. Make sure you go to makeship.com slash products slash Casper dash longboy dash plush, or just click the link in the description box. Gambling on platforms like Twitch has been controversial for a while now. Twitch does have the power to stop it, and they seemed all too happy to crack down on hot tub streamers once upon a time. But with the asinine amount of money these gambling streams are raking in, the platform's reactions have been pretty minimal at best. Plus with massively famous and successful names like Drake attached to these streams, this content has become a true staple on Twitch, though more on him in just a moment. At any time, you can search for gambling or casinos and come across these brightly colored gambling streams. Some of them like Sugar Rush have dead-eyed neon colored teddy bears, bright stars, and other candy shapes. These streamers tell their audience that these games can really turn around before you know it. And after a few short spins, you'll watch them supposedly earning thousands, if not even millions of dollars. 160X, 160K, 160,000, right? (laughs) Maybe you chase that high along with them, scared and anxious once their wallet drops closer to zero, only to cheer and root them on when they earn it all back and then some. Dopamine, serotonin, whatever the hell it is, you know that gambling is playing off of that little rush that you get and you can't help but watch. And when the stream ends, maybe you consider trying it yourself. It's only a few bucks after all. Plus the streamers made so much money, so what's the harm in just one spin, right? I think we all know the answer to that, considering that these games are designed to be addictive. But there's a bit more to this aside from brightly colored candies and virtual casinos. Either Drake, who stepped in to make this content even more popular by teaming up with the crypto casino and sports betting platform known as Stake, He joined not only to win real money, but to give it away in tips to his fans that watched him play. In one of his streams on January 11th, 2022, it had tens of thousands of viewers watch him earn millions of dollars, seeing his balance climb to over $20 million. Of course, various highlights and other YouTube channels have stressed that it's not as if this lasted. Drake lost everything he earned and then some by the end of the night because he seemingly didn't know where to stop. In total, from December, 2021 to February, 2022, Drake allegedly bet over $1 billion in total. Like that's how often he was playing and the kind of money he was betting. But the problem here is that it's not just adults 18 and older watching these streams, but kids are watching too. You'd think that that would be enough to make Twitch and these streamers a bit more careful, but that's not really the case. And Drake, with the massive views he's pulling in, is no exception to this either. Although Twitch did ban referral codes and certain links on their platform in some sort of attempt to curb the spread of gambling, creators can easily circumnavigate this with some hosting giveaway in their chat and putting their referral codes on Discord. Gambling platforms like Stake might say they're not available in the US as internet gambling by bettors in the US is actually illegal and states have to regulate it on their own terms. But let's be real here for a minute, Plenty of people can simply use a VPN and with a few clicks, they're able to access popular online casinos. A few opinion pieces have come out saying that even if Twitch doesn't care about age gating the gambling on their platform, the streamers need to step up and do better. One of these pieces on Inven Global cited a 2013 study by the Journal of International Gambling Studies, which showed that, I'm sure big surprise here, the teenage years are extremely formative into who someone is going to be in their adult life. So yes, These gambling streams are warping their viewers idea of what gambling is, making it seem like it's all fun and games when that's not exactly the reality. And that's especially when casinos like Stake are supposedly paying streamers a ton of money. And I'm talking like $900,000 a week to play their games. It's not as if many of these streamers are just regular users that sign on, toss a few hundred dollars into the slots and make bank. They're typically getting paid and using house money to make their bets all while creating the illusion that these wins are authentic. But the lies don't matter because it's just so popular. Now, here's the thing. Does Drake have a gambling problem? I've got no idea. I obviously don't know Drake personally. And he simply may walk into these games with whatever the house gives him and the intention to spend it all because if he's getting sponsored, who cares, right? Personally, what I find gross is that Drake knows he's famous, he has influence, and doesn't seem like he's being fully transparent when he easily could be. Like, yeah, 
it's great that he gave some money to his viewers. I'd hazard a guess that some of them are going to use that money on these casino apps and lose far more than Drake gave them. That's just my opinion, of course, but I'm not the only one who sees an issue with this. Drake, as well-known as he is, could have refused the offer unless more precautions were taken to keep minors from entering the stream. Sure, it said 18 plus, but there's really no way to enforce it. It's just as heartening to see that even though Drake isn't exactly hurting for money here, he's promoting online gambling to potentially young viewers for, you know, well, whatever stake is paying him. Maybe Drake is a puppet of online gambling as some have suggested, or maybe he's just using this as an opportunity to, you know, get paid a couple extra bucks. Regardless, Stake stands to benefit from their relationship for one giant reason, the trust people have in Drake. And sometimes, Those that support Drake will stand by him no matter how scummy he gets. Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket. I'm the Illuminati and today we're gonna be talking about who Drake is and his rather sketchy background. Now, although he's made a lot of headlines recently for his online gambling controversy, Drake has practically been a household name for quite some time now. Here's a brief recap on who he is in case you may not be familiar or forgot. His father was a drummer for Jerry Lee Lewis, but he was primarily raised by his mother and attended a Jewish day school. He felt extremely isolated in the Forest Hill community where he grew up, later saying that, quote, "'Nobody understood what it was like to be black and Jewish. Being different from everyone else just made me a lot stronger.'" His claim to fame happened early on in life though, when he landed the role of Jimmy on the Canadian teenage drama, Degrassi. Though we talk about the meaning of being self-made and how so many people often have help, Drake really did build his career from the ground up. He started writing lyrics in his late teenage years and according to him, was even kicked off Degrassi in 2008 because of his hectic music schedule. Just a year later, his third mixtape featuring the song, Best I Ever Had, found great success under his very own label, propelling Drake into stardom. 2009 was a whirlwind. He was seen making out with Rihanna, he was signed to Lil Wayne's new label in a massive bidding war, and teamed up with Kanye West, Lil Wayne, and even Eminem to produce a song for the LeBron James documentary. The list goes on. There's really no understating that Drake found incredible success and it seemed to be the result of hard work and years of dedication and talent too. It wasn't handed to him on a silver platter. His fan base grew and those that loved his music have said it's because of his emotion. Drake gets emotional and introspective on his tracks and his relatable lyrics are one of the reasons why he's been called one of the most important artists of his generation. But there are a few points of contention here because while Drake might say that he started from the bottom or seem to imply that he made his career out of nothing, it's not as if he actually grew up at the bottom. The average income for private households in Forest Hill, the neighborhood in Canada where he grew up, is more than six figures, about $101,000 a year. Those that talk about Drake's struggle will sometimes joke that it's nothing more than middle-class people problems. So his supposed crawl from poverty's trenches just isn't accurate. Like, let's be real, the worst thing that happened to him was getting shot on a television show. He didn't live the same struggle he portrays. But it makes for a good story, sure. Like we've talked about what being self-made is plenty of times before. Drake seems very willing to tell his story because he's trying to be, as one fan put it, authentically hip hop or hood, even if his background just doesn't really fit with that narrative. While started from the bottom, now we're here is a catchy tagline, it sure seems a bit of a stretch to call his upbringing the bottom. Sure, Drake can rap whatever the hell he wants and those lyrics are his choice, obviously. Personally, I just take issue with people underplaying financial privileges and advantages they had growing up because I feel like it continues to perpetuate this idea that it's easy and accessible to achieve the American dream, when in reality, that's not the case. And yes, I am aware he's Canadian. I just know that the American dream holds like context of being like, you can start from rags and get to riches kind of situation. Just roll with me on that. I know he's Canadian. The truth is crawling out of poverty is extremely difficult when you don't have a leg up. It's even more insulting when you think about how many people in the hip hop and rap industry did actually crawl out of poverty to get where they are. You can't just co-opt other people's life stories. Another important point to make here is how Drake represents himself to his fans. Not only is he a celebrity and musician, but many believed he was genuinely kind. For example, at one concert, he called out a male fan for groping women during his show, condemning the behavior. He's advocated for the feminist movement and had people awing him when he was collecting Birkin bags to give to his future wife. 
As Refinery29 puts it, he's hip hop's good guy, the handsome, kind, and sensitive one. Even though Drake was at the Astroworld concert, co-starring with Travis Scott, he still seemingly maintained this squeaky clean image. After all, the footage that was released largely showed Scott being more to blame for potentially inciting the attendees, resulting in nine deaths after crowd surge. Drake did make some headlines for being named in a lawsuit along with Scott and Astroworld, but it sure seems like he wasn't aware of the situation and his apology sure looked more heartfelt than Travis Scott's, even though that isn't exactly saying much. One article has even stated that he quote, represents a new breed of young men, a breed that according to the article, doesn't just talk about drugs and guns, but respects women and aren't afraid to be honest with their audience. Firstly, the words breed of young men is definitely just weird wording to me. Like maybe just don't refer to a group of people as a breed. I don't know. It just feels kind of creepy or weird. I can't really place my finger on it, but something about it is just kind of giving me the ick. But secondly, how different is he? Is Drake actually the clean cut, honest and emotional image he's portrayed to be? Or do the accusations of him being a groomer actually have some weight to them? Let's start with how Drake openly treats women and then we'll talk about who he allegedly is behind closed doors. Drake's respect towards women only goes so far. Even fans of the rapper admit that it pains them to say it, his persona and actions are in direct contrast to one another. Megan Hunt wrote on Affinity Magazine that, you listen to his music and develop this picture in your head of a man who will think you're pretty without makeup, someone who thinks you deserve better friends, someone who still calls his mom regularly. But at the same time, he's slut shamed and spoken as if women owe him something for his nice guy persona too. Megan uses plenty of Drake's songs as examples, like the lyrics, I'm such a gentleman, you should give it up for me. One lyric that especially got under people's skin was the one from Certified Lover Boy where he raps, yeah, you say that you a lesbian girl, me too. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Those are song lyrics. It's just a song and frankly, better than a lot of things that have been said about women by rappers before. Joking around saying, haha, I'm a lesbian too. Sure, it may be insulting for some, but others think this isn't worth reaming him for. Like it's just not worth the criticism, but fine. What about calling the mother of your child a fluke? Drake had a child with Sophie, a former porn star, and essentially hid his son's existence from the world. Not only did his representatives call Sophie a liar before Drake himself confirmed the child Adonis was actually his, but then in his album, Scorpion, he had the nerve to refer to her as a fluke. The exact lyrics are, baby mama fluke, but I love her for who she is. The thing is, it's not as if a lot of reputable sources are reporting on the topic. I'm sure there are fans that may say this wasn't intentional or it was exaggerated. Yet I would have to assume that someone as big as Drake has a team of producers and musicians working on his tracks. There's no way that this was only heard once by him, approved, and then sent into the world. People heard this. He and his team heard this multiple times, heard it, heard it, heard it, and then said, yeah, we're good with it. Let it go live. But it gets worse because on the same album, he sampled some incredibly famous women singing only for the songs they're featured in to be, well, critical of women. In the song Emotionalist, he rapped, I know a girl whose one goal was to visit Rome. Then she finally got to Rome and all she did was post pictures for people at home cause all that mattered was impressing everybody she's known. If Drake wants to make a point, that's fine. But why did he need to sample Mariah Carey's song Emotions on it? Obviously I cannot speak for Mariah Carey, but it sure doesn't seem like that's what her lyrics were intended for. It just feels a bit disrespectful to the original artist, to the intent of the song Emotions itself. Now he also samples Lauren Hill from her track X Factor on his song, Nice For What. The music video of the song has a lot of women in it. Issa Rae, Misty Copeland, Rashida Jones, Olivia Wright, and many, many more, which is awesome, right? Which is great, of course, until he just kind of calls them hoes throughout the whole song. Refinery29 argues that Drake was trying to act like a hero or a savior towards women just to make himself look good. The song made headlines like, I don't need Drake's feminist anthem, Nice For What, it won't fix hip hop's misogyny problem. Some didn't call Drake's new hit a feminist anthem, but said that most of his songs are sad fuckboy anthems instead, which is great. Other articles questioned if nice for what would redeem him while some praised it for being wholesome and marking a new era for feminist Drake. Again, I do not know Drake personally. I don't know his intentions. Maybe they were pure here. I personally just find it hard to believe that he was really all that invested and careful about how he rapped about women when he literally called Sophie a fluke in the same album. Not to mention, he doesn't exactly treat all women the same either. 
Yes, he did jump on the opportunity to sample Mariah Carey for a track, but on another one of his songs, he used his ex-girlfriend's voice without her permission. According to Erica Lee, his ex, they agreed to work on the song Marvin's Room and split the proceeds. She was asked to record the song's hook and monologue and Drake even acknowledged how important Lee's contribution was texting, you basically made that song. But for someone who basically made it, Drake seemed pretty hesitant to give her proper payment and credit. Drake insisted that he didn't promise her anything. And though some tabloids suggested that the lawsuit was settled, there's nothing else really said about the case. That same Refinery29 article that started off with high praise for the changes Drake made in the industry ended on a low point, stressing that he's merely not as reckless as other rappers. Unplanned pregnancy happens, but Drake didn't only ignore his responsibilities, he seemed embarrassed by Sophie too. After all, this is the same guy that rapped about how much he values college degrees versus women that are involved in porn, all while having a child with a former porn star. I don't really think you can be a feminist while simultaneously building women up and then breaking others down. This sentiment has been echoed in opinion pieces everywhere. Drake isn't really a feminist. He's just not as sexist as other rappers that may consistently degrade women's bodies in their lyrics. That seems to be a pretty consistent narrative. Sure, he doesn't use objectifying language as frequently, but is that really raising women up? Maybe yes to somebody, I guess. Like he uses the term bitches and hoes enough that it just feels like it shouldn't be something like to be proud of. Like you shouldn't really be calling yourself a sensitive, like feminist in tune rapper or whatever. Sophie, as it should go without saying, deserves respect regardless of if she has a college degree or not. Drake shouldn't be ashamed because in his eyes, he was dating someone uneducated or lesser. That's just not the case. Drake should be ashamed because of the way he handled the situation and insulted her, nothing more. Between this, his questionable lyric choices and mixed reviews on his feminist anthems and the doubts around sampling his ex-girlfriend's voice, the way Drake treats women isn't 100% black and white. Maybe you give him credit for the massive changes he's made to the music industry and don't see a problem with some of his language. Or maybe you believe he's just a hypocrite. Reactions are mixed here and understandably so. But when it comes to how Drake treats girls, as in minors, well, then the credit some fans give him starts to run dry. And before we go ahead to talk about some of Drake's um, interests in underage girls, I'm going to go ahead and put today's sponsors here. It's gonna be a quick little two to three minute point for you to sit and think about it. Do I wanna hear about this or not? If you don't, I'll go ahead and see you next episode. Great having you here today. But I'm just letting you know that after this ad break, um, we're gonna talk about some disturbing shit. So that was your warning. With Masterclass, you can learn from the world's best minds, anytime, anywhere, and at your own pace. You can learn modern Japanese cooking with Nikki Yakayama, or you can learn about wine appreciation with James Suckling, or if you're so inclined, you can learn about creativity and leadership with Anna Wintour. With over 180 classes from a range of world-class instructors, that thing you've always wanted to do is closer than you think. Now, recently I've been taking the creativity and leadership classes with Anna Wintour. And honestly, I just love her voice. I love the way she speaks. I could just listen to her talk about anything for hours. But as the holiday season is approaching, I realize people like to drink wine and champagne and different types of wines and all that good stuff. And I am unfortunately horrifically educated in the wine department because I don't really drink that much. So the wine appreciation class with James Suckling has been absolutely monumental to me. I know I've mentioned it before. It is very helpful. It's something I can continue to rewatch because I seem to always forget. And it's great because I can go back, watch it for about 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then have a decent enough understanding that I can sit at the dinner table and understand what the hell I'm actually talking about and what I'm actually drinking. And what's really going to be great about Masterclass is that it's not necessary to sit down and just watch a full class from start to finish. You can start in little sections like 10 minutes at a time and slowly chunk your way through each course and learn at your own pace. That is super, super important. So if you're ready to learn something new, brush up on a skill, or just even just refresh your mindset a little bit, make sure you check out Masterclass. This holiday, give one annual membership and get one free. Go to masterclass.com slash casket today. That's masterclass.com slash casket, terms apply. Self-care is always something that's top of mind for me, but in between meditation sessions or trips to a yoga studio or even a nail salon, how often are you taking care of all your needs? Well, transport your mind to a world where you can relax and treat yourself with Dipsy. Self-care has never sounded better. Now, Dipsy is an app full of hundreds of short, sexy audio stories designed by women for women and they're racially inclusive. They have stories for straight and queer listeners and 56% of stories are voice acted by people of color. But hey, 
sexy doesn't always have to be the mood, right? Sometimes it's just not the vibe and I get it, I've been there too. Well, Dipsy also offers sleep stories and wellness sessions, great things that you can listen to and just kind of unwind with because life is stressful and the holiday season, very stressful. I don't know why everyone says it's the happiest time of the year because I swear to God, this is the most stressful time of the year and almost any way to unwind is a surefire win in my book. So for listeners of the show, Dipsy is offering an extended 30-day free trial when you go to dipsystories.com casket. That's 30 days of full access for free when you go to dipsystories.com casket. That's D-I-P-S-E-A stories.com, dipsystories.com casket. Please note that this next section will contain mentions of sexual assault. And again, let me just throw it out there that not a lot of reputable sources are reporting on this. So feel free to take what I'm saying with a grain of salt, but I am trying to stick to what we know that Drake has done and not insert too much speculation outside of it. One of these incidents is pretty obviously disgusting and we know it happens because you can actually watch it play out on stage. Here's the scenario. At one of Drake's concerts in 2010, when Drake was 23, he invited a fan on stage. He danced with her, kissed her neck, and even commented on her shampoo. I've got no idea if she liked this, but it's not as if that matters when she told Drake that she was only 17. Drake said, You'd think that that would be the end of it and Drake would apologize and she'd leave the stage but Drake's comments grew a little bit more disgusting. He then tells her, I don't know if I should feel guilty or not, but I had fun. I like the way your breasts feel against my chest. So talking about a 17 year old's boobs on stage, real, real classy stuff here, especially when he's 23. He absolutely should have known better. And for those of you who are listening who are above the age of 23, because I know when I heard this comment initially and I read it, and then of course, you know, I like when I had to go look at the video, I was like, oh dear. But I thought about it and I was like, when I was 23 years old, I was like, nope, mm-mm. Yeah, I, I didn't look at a 17 year old. And I was like, ooh, yeah, fabulous boobies. Like that just didn't ever cross my mind. So it's one of those things where I'm like, how exactly did you get to that and then to say that all on stage publicly at a concert. Like it just doesn't click for me, but apparently it clicked for him. What's worse yet about this is fans were actually cheering for him and many seemed to just laugh about it when Drake said he didn't know if he should feel bad. The cheers only grew louder when he kissed the fans cheeks and forehead. This clip started resurfacing around sometime in 2019 after even more rumors and skepticism about his relationships with minors started making headlines. Around that time, Drake was called out for having a weird relationship with Millie Bobby Brown, who plays Eleven in Stranger Things. At the time, Millie was 14 years old and Drake was 31 years old when they met and they struck up a friendship that both said was a friendship or a mentorship, whatever they wanna call it, and nothing more. Other sources, though again, many of them aren't the most reputable in the world, they claim that the text between them show something a little deeper and Drake was supposedly texting Millie how much he missed her. When she turned 18, a TikTok user played audio from a SpongeBob episode that says, finally, I've been trying to catch you boys all day (laughs) beneath her 18th birthday. It should be funny. I'm sorry. I love a good SpongeBob meme. I'm so fucking tacky, but you guys know the the quote and how it goes, but it was underneath her 18th birthday photo. It was again meant to imply that, hey, Millie was finally 18 and legal to do stuff with, which again is a really fucking gross implication. Drake, in a moment of sheer stupidity, commented lol beneath the TikTok. Not exactly what you'd want to see on a comment beneath a video like this, but perhaps to her, this really was just a lovely friendship, but people were hesitant to give the benefit of the doubt to Drake. Drake was supposedly dating a model that was not much older than Millie around the same time. So it really doesn't make anything better to like add context to just the time frame that this was all going on. Now, unfortunately, it's been widely speculated and rumored that Drake was dating model Bella Harris when he was 31 and she was only 18. US Magazine has reported that they aren't dating while others said the caption of her, no place I'd rather be on a photo of them together was a couple confirmation. So did Drake date her? I don't know. I've also got no clue about what kind of text he may have sent Billie Eilish when she was 17, but Billie staunchly defends their friendship too. He may or may not have been with Kylie Jenner or other members of the Kardashian family too, but again, there's no confirmation either way. 
But what we can confirm is his absolutely disgusting behavior on stage and his off-putting comments in response to a video celebrating Millie finally turning 18 years old. Like clearly he knew that fans believed he was interested in Millie and wanted to sleep with her. People were throwing out groomer accusations at him. So you might think that he'd be careful about what he was saying, but nope, apparently not. He just commented lol under the video as if it was just one big joke to him. While the birthday bash for Kylie, the reputed relationship with Bella Harris and singer Georgia Smith, who was supposedly dating Drake when she was 19 and he was 30, or the text with Millie, I don't know how far any of these interactions actually went, but it does feel strange that Drake has had so many close relationships with young girls over the years. Surely it can't be that hard to stay away from minors, right? Or I mean, I would think not. I don't know. I mean, maybe don't talk about a 17 year old's breasts on stage. Like that could be a really good start in like 2010 and he couldn't even do that then. And that's been like 12 years since then. So I, I don't know. But the real question here is, does this mean that Drake's career is coming to an end or that he's getting canceled? Well. I highly doubt that, unfortunately. Controversy has embroiled Drake for a while now. It just doesn't stick to him. Whenever truly large controversies or lawsuits have come his way, they haven't seemed to hit the mainstream media. Back in 2017, a woman by the name of Laquana Morris, who goes by Layla Lace, accused him of sexual assault. He insisted that everything between them was consensual, but still ended up settling for $350,000. Layla's story didn't seem to add up at first, but even after she filed a complaint with the New York Attorney Grievance Committee against her own attorney, the case has remained quiet. Other lawsuits that haven't really made headlines in anything but tabloids include Noelle Detail Fisher accusing Drake of sicking a bodyguard on him and copyright infringement in his music. Even when violence surrounding him has made the news, it's often specified that his entourage or his bodyguards are the ones involved, going overboard with people close to him or being rude to drivers in Toronto traffic. And that means that Drake himself still comes out of the situation looking innocent. But here's the thing, whether Drake was the aggressor or not, and some say he has been, the various stories around Drake's security team going overboard should be something that he can't prevent. If they're truly roughing up Shawn Mendes and acting superior and just plain dangerous to drivers on the road, then he should be firing them for that. Even if I will admit that I frankly couldn't care less that it may have been like because of a fight with Chris Brown. But in the same way, if Drake gets a reputation for being sketchy around underage girls, then there's a simple solution. Maybe stop texting those underage girls. Also, as a brief note here, since initially writing this script, Stake and many other gambling sites have actually been banned by Twitch. Their partial gambling ban is at least a step forward, though many believe it's not enough. But with all of that being said, that is where we're going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you learned something new here today. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, following, and subscribing to stay up to date on all the latest details. Thank you so much for joining me. I really do appreciate it. And I'll see you in the next one.